Thanks, Reuben. Good afternoon. Great to see you all. We're going to pray together now. We're going to use some words from the book of Romans in chapter 10. Help with our prayers. Let's pray together. Romans 10, verses 8 and 9 say this. The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Father, we want to praise you this afternoon for the gift of faith. We thank you, Lord, that we can have confidence in what we see of the future, not because of ourselves, but because of the Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for a reminder in this passage here in Romans that if we are truly believing in the Lord Jesus, there's nothing to fear even in the face of death itself, uh, that because of Jesus' perfect sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection, uh, we can be confident of eternity safe in your hands. And we want to thank you this week as we uh, grieve with the man family, the death of Reuben's mum, that Reuben's mum, Jane, is with you indeed, surely, which is better by far. Lord, we thank you for the confidence we have uh, because our faith is in you and not ourselves. Lord, we pray for Reuben and Hannah Uh, for Henry, Oscar, and Lucy, for the wider family. We pray you would comfort them as they grieve in these days. Strengthen them. Help them to have a confidence in the resurrection still to come. And Lord, we thank you that you're with them, even to the very end of the age. Read on in Romans. Romans 10, verse 17. Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Father, we thank you, Lord, that as we begin a new term, we're reminded that our faith comes by hearing the word about Christ. Father, we pray as a church family, as we embark on a new academic year, we'd keep doing the things that you've been helping us to do so far, to keep opening up your powerful word. Lord, we're praying that it will be applied in our hearts by your Spirit's power, that we would grow in faith, that we'd grow in love for you, that we'd grow in love for one another, that we'd grow in love for the community around us, that we're growing love for a lost world that needs to hear the good news of the Lord Jesus. Uh, Father, we pray for uh, the teaching of your word in the, in the term ahead uh, on Sundays, particularly for Reuben as he preaches week by week. Bless him and encourage him in that task. Uh, for the word as it's taught in the Sunday school classes and the uh, home groups and the ladies' Bible studies and all sorts of other forums, Lord, help us never to doubt the power of your word to help us to grow in faith and to help us to grow into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray too as we we long to grow in our faith through the teaching of your word. We pray as we advertise at the moment for an assistant pastor or a minister in training uh, that you might raise up in your kindness just the right person at the right time to join us here to encourage us in these really important things. And Lord, we pray too for our nation. Uh, Lord, so often just lost and looking for hope and direction in all sorts of ways. We pray, please, there might be a turning again to your word as a place to find faith and confidence for all things. Finally, read Romans 10, 8 and 9. Sorry, Romans 10, 14 and 15. How then can they call on the one they've not believed in? How can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Father, we pray, please, you'd help us to be faithful in scattering the seed of the gospel in our homes, in our workplaces, in the community around us, and to the ends of the earth. Thank you for opportunities to do, to do that over the summer. We pray, please, you might cause those seeds to grow that are being planted in people's hearts. Thank you for the freedom there was for things like Holiday Club. Thank you for the freedom this morning to be at, uh, a team to be at Savannah Nursing Home. We thank you for the... Um, Youth and Children's Ministry opportunity starting in church and at uh, St. John's School this week with a new CU and at Marlborough College with Christian Forum. Lord, we pray for fruit among children and young people. And Lord, we pray, please, amongst our family and friends, there might be a, a turning to you in the coming months. Lord, we long to see people saved. And we pray, please, you'd help us to be faithful in, in, in speaking the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, that people might receive a wonderful gift of faith. So Lord, we thank you for all these things. Uh, We commit them to you, knowing that you hear our prayers, you delight to hear them, and they are a loving Heavenly Father. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good. Well, please do have your Bibles open to the passage there in uh, Hebrews. We're going to start having a one-off sermon today, uh, reflecting a little on some of the things we learned together in home groups uh, last term from Hebrews, particularly Hebrews uh, chapter 11. Our theme is faith-filled confidence. Faith-filled confidence. Let me turn up uh, Hebrews here. Hebrews 11, we're on page 1,209. Uh, let me pray one more time that God would indeed be at work in our hearts this afternoon by faith. Here are these words at the end of uh, uh, one, in, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2. Let's pray with these in mind. Father, we pray, please, that the preaching of the word today would come not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that our faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on your power. Father, we do indeed pray that you might be at work again in our lives, indeed, even in these next moments. We pray that same for the children. Lord, we need you. We pray you'd speak to us today. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, earlier in the summer, we were down as a family in Cornwall, helping out with a beach mission. And uh, in the evenings, we had to go out on the streets trying to share something of the good news of Jesus with holiday makers who were passing by. Of course, he met with quite a mixed response. Um, one day, one guy was very angry with me and seemed angry with the world. But on other occasions, people were really interested to hear about things to do with Jesus, searching and seeking. There was one evening, uh, two of the team had a conversation with a particular lady. She lived locally in a middle age middle ages, and uh, she said something to those team members that was very interesting indeed. She said, I'd love to have your faith, but I just don't think I'm good enough. I'd love to have your faith, but I just don't think I'm good enough. Maybe there are one or two of you here this afternoon, and you think something similar. You'd love to have faith, but you're just not sure how that's possible. Or maybe you had a faith at some point in your life. Maybe it was really strong. But the events of life, difficult circumstances perhaps, for all sorts of reasons over the years, that faith seems to have been lost. Perhaps the majority here this afternoon do have a faith, of course, of some kind, a clear faith in God. But aren't there times we look at that faith in our lives and we, we just feel it's not quite where we'd like it to be? We're left thinking sometimes, aren't we? Where, where does that leave us with God if our faith feels so weak sometimes? As Hebrews 11 opens, we have this wonderful, great description of faith. We see it there in the first verse, don't we? Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. A great definition of faith. It's followed, followed of course, by this great cloud of witnesses, this collection of stories of, of what God's people in history did by faith. And it's remarkable, isn't it? A remarkable list. As you read through the list, as, as Abby led us earlier on, we can, we can hear these stories and just feel so inspired, can't we? We're inspired by Noah, his ark built on dry ground while people all around, no doubt, were laughing in his face. We're inspired by Abraham, setting off to a land as yet unknown, not really knowing what was before him, but going anyway. We're inspired by Moses, his reputation disregarded for the sake of Christ, leaving all the luxuries of palace life so he could be with God's people. We're inspired as we read on later in that uh, chapter, there in chapter 11. We're inspired by the acts of faith of those unnamed brothers and sisters who were told lived by faith and at the same time faced jeers and flogging, chains and imprisonment. Some were told were stoned, sawn in two, killed by the sword. Verse 38, that phrase that Reuben picked out, the world was not worthy of them. Inspiring to hear, isn't it? Inspiring to hear of people living by faith and doing such great things by faith. We move on into the history of the church. And we see, again, examples of God's people doing wonderful things by faith. As many of you know, I serve with a mission agency called UFM. We're often, as an organization, inspired by the stories of, of faith of those who have come before, the incredible things God helped them to do by faith all around the world, often uh, with great sacrifice involved. We're often inspired in UFM by a story called the Three Freds. Three young men, all called Fred as it happened, hence the name Three Freds, martyred in the 1930s, taking the gospel to a tribe in Brazil that had never heard about Jesus before. 
or were inspired in our organization by the 19 missionaries and children killed by rebels in a place, uh, a, a time called the Simba Rebellion in Congo, 1964. We're inspired by the sacrifice that they would make living by faith. We're inspired by a lady called Margaret Hayes who was at the same time in the same place for seven months in captivity to those same rebels, yet who by faith had been willing to lay her life down that other people might be saved during that time as a hostage. Then remarkably, her life being spared, having had unspeakable things done to her by those rebels, by faith, she was even willing to go back to that very same place a number of years after her release from captivity. We're inspired, aren't we? We're moved by these incredible acts of faith. The ones we read in the Bible, the ones we see in church history, perhaps the ones we see in some of our Christian friends or reading Christian biographies. And yet, friends, don't we sometimes find ourselves thinking, yeah, I'm inspired by these stories, but am I really like them? Maybe you say to yourself, what I've been doing barely merits a mention in the church news email. (laughs) Never mind a place in Hebrews 11. We reflect on our own faith, perhaps, and its strength or lack of. And maybe that inspiration with some of these stories turns to a bit of a desperation. Because we reflect on our lives, and we consider our works, and we know our weaknesses, and we carry the shame of the things that we've done or thought or said that are never going to make it into the prayer times in our small groups. What do we do with feelings like that? Feelings of inadequacy. Weakness, maybe guilt when it comes to our own faith. Well, as we meet together this afternoon and come to Hebrews 11, we're going to be reminded of two beautiful realities that this passage speaks about when it comes to faith. Two realities that we need to hear time and time again. Here's the first. We are in God's family by faith, not because of the good things we do by faith. We are in God's family by faith, not because of the good things we do by faith. Look again at the first two verses of Hebrews chapter 11. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. This, i.e., this faith. The faith they had is what they were commended for, not the things they were doing. We have the same idea again at the end of the chapter, there in verse 39. These, that is this big long list of, perhaps we call them heroes in the Bible, these were all commended for their faith. Notice, it doesn't say they were commended for the good things they did by their faith. They were commended for their faith. Can we see, friends, these people are in, these people are accepted not because of anything good they've done, but because of everything good that he has done. They're in by faith in the perfect Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the remarkable thing about the Christian message, isn't it? And yet, again, what do we find ourselves thinking sometimes? In the Christian life, it's so easy to fall into the same old traps, isn't it? We know we're saved by faith. We know it's all by grace. God has treated us in ways we don't deserve. And yet there we are, perhaps comparing ourselves to other Christians. Or there we are weighing up what we've done by faith and wondering, is it really enough? To which this passage says so clearly, we are in God's family by faith, not because of the good things we do by faith. Now, praise God, by that faith, God can and he does use us in all sorts of incredible ways in his world. You know, to have experiences of that in your own life. You've seen that happen in in the lives of other Christian people over the years. But you know, friends, as we marvel and as we rejoice and as we're challenged by seeing incredible things done by faith, we must never, ever forget we are in God's family by faith, not by those good things God helps us to do by faith. Which I have to say is a very good job, isn't it? It's a very good job because... If these people in Hebrews 11 had got in by the good things they did by faith, and if we had to get in God's family by the good things we did by faith, we'd be in all sorts of trouble, wouldn't we? Think about the rest of Scripture and how these very same people are described, how they lived at other times. If you read the rest of the Bible, you'll see the drunk and naked Noah. You'll see the lying and at times lacking in faith, Abraham. 
You'll see the boastful Joseph, the manipulative Jacob, and so the list goes on. Where would they be if they only got in because of the good things they'd done by faith? No, they are in, and we are in, not because of anything good that we have done, but because of everything good that Jesus Christ has done. And what he has done is enough. Therefore, Hebrews 11, verse 1, we can be sure of what we hope for, and we can be absolutely confident of what we do not see. Christian friends, it's wonderful to hear these things over again, isn't it? It's liberating. We have nothing to prove to a God who loves us and has sent his son Jesus to die for us because the object of our faith, the Lord Jesus, he's done it all. And what he has done is enough. The life he lived was flawless. His obedience to the Father, perfect. His sacrifice on the cross in our place, perfect also. So perfect, you may know, the book of Hebrews says, having died in our place, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Hebrews 10, 12. His work was done. Oh. And his gift of faith, therefore, to us is sufficient. We are accepted, we are forgiven, adopted, included by faith in Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. I hope we're encouraged as we hear these things again, those of us who already have believed in the Lord Jesus. But I wonder again, maybe there are one or two here this afternoon, and this news about faith, well, maybe it comes as something of a a surprise or a bit of a shock. Because, well, maybe you've been hoping that the good standard of your life will be enough to please God, to gain his acceptance, to earn his forgiveness. It's how many, many people in our world think, isn't it, about how we might relate to God. And so perhaps you could sum up your faith, your confidence in the future a bit like this. You're trying your best, and therefore you're hoping for the best. You're trying your best, therefore as you look to the future, you're kind of hoping for the best. You hope in the end it's going to be okay. That is, you're aiming to live a decent life with the hope that maybe it'll be good enough in the end. That when you meet your maker, you'll have done enough to get in. Friend, the Bible says that is not how it works. It's not how it works. Listen to this from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. The Apostle Paul says, For it is by grace you have been saved. That is, here is a precious gift we don't deserve from God. It's by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Do you hear that? We can be saved, we can be forgiven, made new through faith alone, not our good works. Where do we get that faith from? The Bible says it's a gift. We don't have to manufacture it somehow ourselves. We don't have to do a load of good stuff to prove we've got this faith. No, the faith we need to be saved is a gift from God himself. And the Bible says this gift is offered to anyone who will simply turn from their sin, stop living for themselves, say sorry to God, and ask for his forgiveness. You know, friend, there is no reason to go through life simply hoping for the best when it comes to the future. Maybe if I can be a bit more bold, let me say it is ludicrous to go through life simply hoping for the best when it comes to the future. The Bible says life is short, death is certain, eternity is a reality. I was reminded of that very tragically this week. Uh, Ernest was a young man, he joined UFM just a couple of months ago, lovely brother from Zambia. He'd been training in the UK. Uh, A church in London had sent him back to Zambia where he was going to be involved uh, leading a church as a pastor and also involved in training other pastors. This last week, he'd been back in the UK uh, to be on a preacher training course in Scotland. And I took a call on Thursday morning. Tragic news had come. Uh, He'd gone to bed on Wednesday evening, 37 years old. He never woke up. Wife, three young children. In a moment, in a moment, he passed from this life to the next. It's just unspeakably sad, isn't it? Unspeakably sad. Yet, friends, the Bible tells us because of his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the future for him is absolutely certain. It's absolutely certain. There's no hoping for the best for Ernest when he meets his maker. His future is absolutely certain because his faith was in the Lord Jesus Christ confidence in what we hope for. 
an assurance about what we do not see. Friends, only Jesus Christ can offer us those things we desperately need in our lives for today and for the future. Friend, I want you to urge you to come to him. Exchange your wishful thinking about the future for absolute confidence in the future. Turn from your sin. Come to Jesus. Accept this precious gift of faith in him. The Bible says we are in by faith, not because of the good things we do by faith. Here's the second thing for us this afternoon in this passage more briefly. We don't ultimately find God's pleasure by doing a load of good things by faith. We please God simply by faith. We say that again. We don't ultimately find God's pleasure by doing a load of good things by faith. No, we please God simply by faith. Forgive me if I make a few generalizations about Christian people. Of course, I'm one myself, so if it's a bit too hard to hear, a bit too close to the bone, you can see it as a critique of myself, if nobody else. Here goes. As Christian people, we often want to make a difference. But sometimes we work too hard and just depend on ourselves. We know it's God's work we're called to be involved in, but we have a tendency to, to depend too much on our own strength. We, we want to please God, but find ourselves worrying if we've really done enough sometimes. When we came back from Indonesia, uh, where we were involved in some mission work about eight years ago now, I felt those things really quite keenly. Had I done enough? We'd gone to serve in mission. We came back sooner than planned, much less achieved than we'd hoped when we set out. Was God not just a little, little bit disappointed in me? How could he be pleased with me off the back of an experience like that? I know I'm not the only one in the room today, I'm sure, to have grappled with questions of that kind. Come with me to verses 5 and 6 in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verses 5 and 6. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now, the Bible speaks of many different, many different ways in which we can please God as his people. Here are a few examples. We can please God by supporting family members, 1 Timothy chapter 5. We can please God by keeping his law, 1 John 3. We can please God by offering our bodies as living sacrifices, Romans 12. We can please God by teaching the word in truth, 1 Thessalonians 2. We can please God by looking out for our weaker brother or sister, Romans 14. They're all different ways that we can please God, the Bible says. But, you know, here in, Rome, here in Hebrews 11, here we have the fundamental principle for pleasing God. Here is the one thing which, if lacking, means it is impossible to please him. There it is so plainly in verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's what we see in the life of Enoch here. At the end of verse 5, we're told he was commended as one who pleased God. Why did he please God? Verse 6 makes it abundantly clear. He was a man who had faith. And again, what was it about the faith of Enoch that meant God was pleased with him? Was it the good things that he had done by faith? This big long list that made him better than all the other people who were trying to be close with God. We'll look again at the passage. What does it say? What was it about his faith that pleased God? Verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Enoch pleased God because he believed God existed. Enoch pleased God because he earnestly sought after him. You know, friends, as we reflect on our Christian lives, for some of us, many, many years of the Christian life, maybe having lived through disappointments and heartaches along the way, challenges and changes that sometimes seem never-ending, 
maybe perhaps if we were honest sometimes, not that much to show for our Christian service. Let's hear this really clearly this afternoon from God's word. If we believe that God exists, he is pleased with us. He's pleased with us. If we have the faith as flickering and dim as it might be, the faith to seek after God, he's pleased with us. You know, if you made a presentation of your good works as a Christian so far in your life, and we're not trying to downplay good works, we're created in our advance to do the good works that God has planned for us, don't mishear me, okay? But if you made a presentation this afternoon of your good works as a Christian so far in your life, God isn't, God isn't going to look over your PowerPoint later on thinking, disappointed, expected a bit more actually. No, he's pleased with you. Or if God examined your prayer life, he's not going to be looking through your prayer diary, if you even have one, and say, seriously, is that it? Could do with a few more entries in there. Could do better. No, God is, God is pleased that you simply believe he exists. God is pleased with your faith to go on believing when perhaps at times all the circumstances around you might tempt you just to pack it all in. And so, friends, as we see signs of faith, both in simple and profound ways in our lives, be encouraged. You belong to him. He loves you. He has welcomed you. And he's pleased with you. God is pleased with you because of faith, not because of a big list of good things you might have done by faith. And you know, friends, there are signs of this faith, a precious gift of God, signs of this faith being lived out all across this room and all across this church family by God's grace. So be encouraged by that. Some of you perhaps have been bruised over the years by the mistreatment of others, and yet you're pressing on, sometimes just limping along. Friends, God is pleased as he sees your faith. Some of you are heartbroken by past divisions in a church or a camp or a team, yet you've not given up. Friends, God is pleased as he sees your faith. Some of you are exhausted by the demands of life, maybe caring for aging relatives, loving your children with all of their particular needs. Maybe at times there seems so little capacity, perhaps to do all the things you might love to do. Let's say, for example, at a church thing sometime during the week, yet you're pressing on. You're loving those God has called you to serve in your family or among your friends. You're crying out perhaps daily for God's help and strength every day. And God is pleased as he sees your faith. Maybe some of you are hurting from longings unfulfilled. Maybe children as yet not given. Or a future husband or wife still not there. In that pain, as deep as it feels, you go on sharing the desires of your heart with God. He sees your faith and he's pleased. He's pleased with that faith. Others of you confronted in unmistakable ways by your weakness, chronic illness, aging bodies. Yet in that weakness, you so clearly believe that God exists and he's pleased. He is pleased when he sees your faith. Still others bereaved in recent months. As you cry out to the Lord from the depths of your despair with nothing to offer, nothing to offer but your tears and your grief, God is pleased. He is pleased as he sees your faith. And maybe some of you here this afternoon may be living through somewhat happier circumstances right now. Maybe you're eager to share with people the incredible things you're seeing the Lord do in your life by faith. Well, God's pleased with you too, but he's not pleased with you because of those great things you're seeing him do through, uh, in your life by faith. He's pleased because of your faith. In the same way, he's pleased with the rest of us by faith. So two things for us here this afternoon in Hebrews chapter 11. They're both remarkable, aren't they, in their own ways. We are in God's family by faith, not because of the good things we do by faith. And God is pleased with us, not ultimately because of all the good things we do by faith, but he is pleased with us because we believe that he exists and we earnestly seek after him. We read Hebrews 11 and the first two verses again as we draw to a close. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the precious gift of faith. Lord, we thank you we're saved by grace through faith, not by any good works that we could do. Lord, we pray we would be thrilled and encouraged and inspired when we hear stories of incredible things done by faith. 
whether that's here in our church family, in our own lives and the lives of others we love, whether it's in stories from church history or the world church today. And we pray too we'd be eager to, to live lives of good works as a, as, a, as a living sacrifice to you. And yet at the same time, Lord, we thank you for the reminder this afternoon you're not sitting in heaven waiting for us to, to complete the next level somehow to find your pleasure. You're not going to look at a, a long list of good works done by faith to decide if we're worthy of being one of your children. Lord, we thank you that we're in your family by faith, not by the good things we do by faith. And we thank you for your smile upon our lives. Thank you for your pleasure in us because we simply believe that you exist. Lord, that's remarkable because that faith itself has come from you, not even from ourselves. Lord, we pray for any here this afternoon who might be recognizing that in a, in a very real sense they're just hoping for the best when it comes to life and the future. Lord, we pray, please, you would give them faith to, to come to you today, turn from their sin, and to put their trust in you, to know the wonderful joy of having sins forgiven, having a new life given, and having a future which is sure and certain because of the finished work of Jesus. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.